Two old friends met one day after many years. One had attended college and now was very successful. The other had not attended college and never made had much ambition. The successful one said, how has everything been going for you? Well, one day I opened the Bible at random, he said, and dropped my finger on a word, and that word was oil. So I invested in oil, and boy, did the oil wells gush. Then another day, I dropped my finger on another word, and it was gold. So I invested in gold, and those mines really produced. Now I'm as rich as the Rockefellers. The successful friend was so impressed that he rushed to his hotel, grabbed a Gideon Bible, flipped it open, and dropped his finger on a page. He opened his eyes, and his fingers rested on the words, chapter 11. <laughs> Today we come to the end of 1 John. John is done writing. And he ends his book uh, not in a standard, bless this person, watch out for that person, but he ends it with three affirmations that every child of God uh, can hold on to. The first affirmation is that everyone who is born of God does not keep on sinning. And you say, wait a minute, I sinned just last week. What he's not saying is that Christians don't sin anymore because that's an impossibility. As long as we have the flesh around us, it will be at war with the Spirit of God and there will be a conflict. And so the word that is used for keep on sinning is a continuous act of a sin. In other words, Christians will have a changed behavior. You need to be able to look back a couple years and see that you have changed. And if you had a extensive life before you were saved, you should be able to look back before you were saved and look now that you are saved and see a difference, see a change. There needs to be a change in behavior for Christians and that we will not have a chronic sinful practice. So if you are involved in a sinful activity, once God gets a hold of you, that will slowly diminish until it goes away so that the sins that Christians commit will be one-offs, one-shot deals because we will be so impacted by the Spirit of God. When we sin, we will confess it, get forgiveness, and then repent of it and not return to it. While someone who doesn't know Christ, does not know God, will return to the same sins over and over again because they give such pleasure. The Christian is not to be that way. We are to be focused on God and what He wants. The second part of the first affirmation, it says that Satan will not be able to touch you. You say, well, wait a minute. Doesn't Satan attack Christians? Well, Satan does. Satan does have things to do, but if we take uh, Job and the upper room as an example, we see that Satan came to God and said, I want to mess around with Job. And Job, God said, you have these limits, you have these parameters, you can do this and this, but not this. Jesus told Peter in the upper room that Satan had asked to sift him like wheat. So Satan is asking permission, and God is putting limits on what Satan can do. Satan is limited by God. If Satan had his way, he would kill every human before they have a chance to be saved so that no one would be in heaven. And so God is able to, because Satan is a creation and God is the creator, he is able to limit him and actually use Satan and demonic forces to his greater glory. And so when something happens to you, when some satanic attack, catastrophe, trauma happens in your life, you need to realize that God is there 
God is with you in it. God hasn't abandoned you. God never abandons you. And the difficult times in our life are not signs of God's abandonment. They're signs of God's love and discipline and care for us. And we need to use those times to dive deeper into our faith and deeper into the Word and deeper into God's heart so that we can grow through these things, we can persevere so that our faith is gone, is growing. So an old preacher was getting uh, weak, felt he was going to die, and he called for his banker and his lawyer to come so that he could settle earthly accounts. And they were ushered into his bedroom, and the preacher held out his hands and motioned them close, and he had one sitting on his right and one sitting on his left. And for a while, the preacher didn't say anything, and then after a while, the lawyer and the banker, being puzzled, said, uh, why are we here? And they thought, maybe it's one of these sermons on greed or one of these sermons on selfishness. Finally, the banker said to the preacher, uh, why don't you ask him why we came? And the old preacher mustered up the strength and said, Jesus died between two thieves, and that's how I want to go. The second affirmation that we can grab a hold of is that Christians are from God and the world belongs to Satan. In God's point of view, there are only two camps in the universe. There are those who belong to Him and those who belong to Satan. And you and I, if we are Christians, we belong to God. We are from God. The Spirit of God that is in us is from God. We are a part of God's family, and we are actually in enemy territory. Uh, from God's point of view, there's only two sides. The world wants us to believe that there are thousands, millions of sides that you, with your free will, can choose anything, and if you're sincere enough, at the end of time, it'll all work out. But at the end of time, there's going to be a judgment, and there's going to be a judge sitting on a throne, and that judge will be Jesus Christ. And whatever anybody believes, they get to defend that belief to Jesus Christ himself, and if they spent their whole life ignoring him, or cursing at him, or denying his existence. That's going to be an interesting conversation between Jesus Christ and the unbeliever. And when it's all said and done, there's only going to be two camps. There's going to be those who end up in heaven with God for all eternity, and those who end up in the lake of fire. And God, uh, Jesus is saying to the disciples, and John is writing to the churches, that you have to realize it is you against the world. Now, we gather together. We are a team against the world, and we have the Spirit of God in us, so we aren't abandoned to the world. But when the world teaches you, when the world preaches at you, when the world with its false beliefs impacts you, you need to realize that you are in enemy territory. And you need to go back to your commander-in-chief, who is Jesus Christ, and your marching orders, which is the Bible, and your chain of command, which comes through prayer. And you need to be strong in the face of these false teachers. The third affirmation, John says, is that there are two gifts. Jesus gave us two gifts. The first is knowledge of God. It is knowledge of the one true God. It is knowledge of the God who exists. People, it is clear from the Gospels that before Jesus came, those who tried to figure out who God was, got it all wrong. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the lawyers, the high priests, who all had these bizarre ideas, almost like organized crime and how God handled things. 
It's clear that on their own, they could not figure out who God was or what God wanted. And when Jesus Christ came, He said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We have a true picture of the one true God through Jesus Christ. And we can read through the Gospels, we can read through the New Testament, and get an accurate picture, now understanding with the Spirit of God in us, of who God is and what God wants from us. Jesus gave for the first time in the history of the world since before the fall a true picture of the one true God. And so somebody who says, well, I believe in God, but I don't like the Bible or I don't like church. I believe God is this way or that. They're guessing and speculating and they're going to get it wrong. The only way we can know who God is is to be taught and instructed by the Bible and the life of Jesus Christ to know who God is. And once we know that, we can function as Christians. Second thing that Jesus gave us is salvation. Jesus could have come and opened universities to teach people about who God was. But if he doesn't save us, we would die as very educated sinners. Jesus Christ came and brought salvation. And in bringing salvation, we now have a relationship with God. We now have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It is now a living and active relationship. It is not an empty ritualistic religion. It is a living communication. We can pray and our prayers are answered. We can read the Bible and the Holy Spirit will illuminate it for us. We can praise and worship Him in song, and we know that He hears and He receives it, and we are the apple of His eye because we know who God is and we are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. This lady was driving down the road, and this is nothing about lady drivers. Don't take it personal. And she was frantic because the guy in front was going really, really slow. And the guy in front kind of slowed down and they came to a signal and it was green. And it turned yellow and he sped through. And the lady, because it started to turn red, also split, spread through. And lo and behold, there was a policeman there. And the siren goes on and pulls her over. And she, she's cussing and she's yelling and she's using hand gestures against the drivers around and just, I mean just out of control and so the, the policeman comes up and gets her out of the car, handcuffs her frisks her and says hold on a minute and goes back and, and calls in the plates and that, you know, the registration and comes back and says oh I'm sorry it was a mistake I just thought because you have a uh, choose life license plate, you have a what would Jesus do bumper sticker, you have a follow me to Sunday school bumper sticker, you have a Jesus is Lord bumper sticker, and you have a chrome plated fish on the back of your car, I just assumed the car was stolen. <laughs> we have knowledge of God. We have salvation. And we need to act like it. We need to take this instruction and apply it to our lives. John finishes with these three affirmations and his conclusion, his final words is, keep yourself from idols. You think, well that's an odd thing. He hasn't talked about idols hardly at all in this book. But what he means by that is that's a very shorthand way of saying don't put anything between you and God. He has given instructions, and his instructions are twofold in this book. One, know the truth. Know the truth about God. Know the truth about Jesus. And once you know the truth, the second thing is love one another. Love other Christians. Form a loving, caring community. And if you do those two things, you will be successful in the Christian life. But yet if I put things between me and God, if I put 
something security, a bank account, if I put something of satisfaction, a new car or a new job, if I'm willing to compromise my love and my Christian values to get a job and to excel in a certain way and to knock other people down. I've worked in high-tech companies for many years before doing this, and the competition amongst internal employees is so great because they want their stock options and they want their recognition and their promotion that people would actually sneak around and destroy other people's work. And for a Christian to be in that type of environment, uh, it's difficult, which is why I regularly got fired out of these high-tech companies because I wouldn't play the ego games. I just wanted to you know, do my work and have an enjoyable time at work. But John is saying if we put anything between us and God, whether it be I trust this more than God, I get more satisfaction out of this than I get out of God, I get more security out of this than I get out of God. If I turn to something of this world rather than God for my life, for an aspect of enjoyment, for anything, then what I'm saying is, God, you're okay in this little box, but over here, I'm going to go to this activity or this feeling or this relationship, and I'm going to seek something other than you. That becomes an idol in our life. Anything that is between us and God is an idol, and it will destroy our knowledge of the truth. It will destroy our loving relationship. So John wrote this book because he came back to Jerusalem and Gnostics or false teachers had come and infiltrated their church and we can say, well, that's all good for them, but we don't have any Gnostics in our church. And that's probably true. But we live in an enemy territory, as I said. And there was a study that was... Uh, done by George Barnum, who's a great pollster for the Christian faith. And he said, uh, what influential Christian leaders are there in America? It was a question. And this is what he came out with. Uh, Billy Graham, 19%. Uh, those 19% are 47 or older. Nobody who's less than 47 years of age said Billy Graham. Uh, Pope Benedict, uh, only because he's in the news. And number three, that one concerns me, our president. To see our president as a Christian leader, no matter how godly the man may be, it's dangerous to look to your government for your religious leadership. Especially in this country, we are supposed to be separate and different. But they do that. Joel Olstein, uh, he's on TV all the time. Uh, Charles Stanley, there's a good one, he should be higher. Uh, Joyce Myers, and then people who have less than 1%. Part of that 1% were people like uh, George W. Bush, Oprah Winfrey. Uh, yeah, pretty much those two. But people who said, not sure, none, and no one, 41%. 41% of Americans say there is no person that they can look to for religious leadership or as an example. And if we are in a religious vacuum, which we are creating, uh, Billy Graham was central for decades, and now that he's left the stage, people are saying, uh, who is it? Who do we look to? Things like that. And the answer is no one for 41%. When those 41% enter a crisis or a challenge of their weak faith, they will pick a Christian or religious leader that may be false, that may lead them down the wrong path. We need to make sure that when teaching is brought into our lives and teaching is brought into your lives, through TV, radio, newspapers, magazines, if you're connected, you have Facebook and Twitter and the internet, and all these voices 
telling us things like it's truth. They are trying to convince you to go down a certain angle. And we need to sort through these voices and only pick the true ones. Only pick the ones that are from God. And begin to remove the false teachers from our lives. There is a movement that is slow in coming, but you may see it in your lifetime. Uh, it started in the Lagos district of Nigeria, which is the other side of Nigeria from our missionaries, which is good. And there's 20 some odd churches in this district of Nigeria. And the pastors got together and they realized that because Jesus is mentioned 24 times in the Quran, the Quran is the holy book of the Muslims, that we can partner with the Muslims to save the world. And so they are having church services that are half Christian, half Muslim. They are reading from the Bible, and they are reading from the Quran, and they are praying to Jesus, and they're praying to Allah, and they're calling it Chrislam. That started and it's in full force in this section of Nigeria. And there's two churches in Philadelphia that have decided to do it too. And I don't know if it's political correctness, I don't know if it's fear, I don't know why they're doing it. But if you go into these two churches in Philadelphia, you will see in the pew a Bible and a Koran right next to each other. And they read from both. And you will see, because the Bible predicts one world religion, eventually, I think this is a good one. If I were to pick one that Satan could really use, I think Chrislam is a great one, because it gives Christians the, you know, well, I'm still using the Bible, and it gives Muslims the, yeah, we conquered them, sort of view. And uh, it's something to watch for. And you will see things like this, and you will see uh, other things that come and try to corrupt the Christian truth, to try to corrupt things, and they will look attractive, and they will look politically correct, and they will look satisfying. And we need to be so steep in our Bible, when we see this, we say, no, that's blasphemy. That's wrong. And people who believe that get to stand in front of Jesus Christ someday, not Muhammad, and explain why they were reading from somebody else's holy book. John says, John teaches us to know and practice the truth and to love one another. We do those two things and you will be faithful, productive followers of Jesus Christ and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I pray that you will protect us, that you will show us the truth, that when we hear these attractive, interesting, provocative ideas of a new form of Christianity, that we will say, wait a minute, I follow the one true God, the God that doesn't change, Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I just pray that you will keep us strong, that you will keep us strong against the political message, that you will keep us strong against the blasphemous message that is coming from so many sources. Lord, I praise you and pray that we will be steadfast, productive followers of Jesus Christ, that we will know and practice the truth and that we will love one another. Lord, I thank you for all this and ask this through the blood and the cross of the true Jesus.